Great, well welcome to the final session of the day and we're going to be talking about new strategies for the British Paleolithic so it's all full of hope and ambition and enthusiasm and first up is Professor Mark White from Durham University talking about lost landscapes of Britain. Okay, um, I'm going to be talking about the Lost Landscapes project and uh, especially the archive document that came out of it, which um, we used as a way of proposing a, a kind of new, a new type of framework um, for the British Paleolithic and one um, in which I want to move uh, away from specifics and towards a, a, a number of general, which I think are philosophies, um, rather than um, actionable plans at the moment. I'm trying also in this to be uh, very inclusive. I notice that um, maybe a lot of this morning's discussion has been focused on Paleolithic archaeology for Paleolithic archaeologists. And I just want to try and move the discussion in a more general way um, and um, offer some ideas as to how we might move this stuff forward. Uh, there is um, a lot of text on my PowerPoints. I am not going to read out the bullet points. Now, there is an aid memoir for myself, mostly because um, the excesses of my youth are haunting me in my middle age. So, uh, moving on, um, I'm speaking on behalf, uh, really, of, of all the people on this list. And um, it, at the time that the Lost Landscapes project was, was going, we all signed up to this. Um, I'm sure that we uh, disagree on a number of issues, but we agree to disagree, and um, if anybody uh, doesn't like what I'm saying, don't blame anybody on that list, blame me. Okay, so what was or is Lost Landscapes? Well, it was a project that was um, initiated by uh, Historic England, then English Heritage, um, under the uh, auspices, I think, of Jonathan Last. And it was aimed specifically at disseminating the results and implications of the uh, Aggregates Levy um, Fund, which ran from uh, until 2011. Um, the project proposal was uh, led by Lyd Stafford um, at OA and was awarded in, in 2013. And the book came out, uh, I think, late last year or early this year. OK, these were the results of the Lost Landscapes um, project, a, a book an edited book uh, with different chapters um, tackling different parts of, of the record. We've got the marine, we've got the terrestrial, we've got methods, uh, and we've got fauna. And I topped and tailed um, this book with a, a general kind of rationale. And at the end, instead of producing um, the usual summary in chapter one we saw in chapter two, I decided actually just to write a polemic um, to try and, and push push things forward, and the the on the on the left here you've got the archive document which has been um, rebadged, rebranded by Liz, and I think has been circulated uh, to some degree. Okay, now we've seen this morning um, the fact that I think that the British Paleolithic is a, is an exceptionally vibrant place. It's very busy. It's very exciting. Um, there are some very good field projects, exemplary even, um, field projects taking place. Um, there are books and papers in abundance. We've got MAs, at least three institutions, and um, Paul Pettit and I have been asked by Durham to try and develop one for our institution. And most importantly, I think, um, is the fact that we've got a um, new generation of postdocs uh, coming through and from my perspective, I'm, I'm really pleased to see a number of those people in the audience today because they've got to live with the decisions that we make and that the directions that we suggest are the ones we want to follow at the moment. And also, I think the British Paleolithic has got what I term the post ahob glow. I, Mr. Leverhulme can't seem to stop throwing money at Nick Ashton at the moment. Um, and so there is this... Um, this thrust, this initiative, this agenda growing um, around the British Paleolithic. And again, in uh, inclusivity, uh, Nick, I do include the Upper Paleolithic in this. Okay, now, I want to say a few words about rates of discovery because it kind of leads on to where my emphasis lies. Um, during the, 
lifetime of the aggregates levy, um, I've got these six sites which I can think of um, as being major discoveries, well excavated, giving us quite a lot of, of very useful information. Now, there's six sites there. Um, sorry if I've left your pet site off. Um, please let me know about it afterwards. If we look just a bit further back in time, uh, pre-2000, um, this picture doesn't look quite so good. Uh, we've got red barns, which we've heard about, Boxgrove, Waverley Wood and Farndon Fields, which I think were pretty much the new sites discovered during um, the period from about uh, the 1970s onwards. Contrast that with um, old sites which have been revisited for a variety of purposes. Beaches Pit is so important it's on there twice. Um, now, the point I want to make here about this is that Rob's distribution map would probably have looked very similar to John Evans. And looking at that distribution map, there's not really um, anything uh, north and west of his line from the Severn to the Wash. There are odd fine spots, but it still is very much a southeast England uh, dominated record. Okay, so that's just a bit of context about the sort of like thing that we found it, it came out of the lost landscapes and a little bit about the way that Paleolithic archaeology works and has worked. Now, um, I want to turn my attention to frameworks. And I think there's three ways in which I consider that the Paleolithic is lost, in the ground or underwater, um, in museums and in the stakeholders' minds. And I want to explain that um, a bit now by going through a framework that we have developed, which we don't see necessarily as being the answer to everything, but which could perhaps provide a series of overarching structures under which uh, planning advice, agendas and priorities um, would fall. Okay, so framing agendas and uh, shaping frameworks. I'm sorry to have to say that I don't think we should be producing any more frameworks of the type we currently have. The research agenda. Um, they're written by academics, they're written for academics, and they're speaking to academics. And I noticed when I was, was writing uh, Lost Landscapes that if we take both frameworks and we look at the research agendas and then we look at what you might call the cons conservation agendas, almost every single one of the research agendas was hit and only one of the conservation agendas was hit. And I've got a very sneaking suspicion that it was on the framework because it had already been achieved. Um, now, one of the problems I find with these research agendas, and I, I've heard this morning that we've got a series of very interesting questions and we're developing new ideas and new methods, but actually I think that most of these questions were probably in the mind of Hugh Falconer um, before he um, persuaded Joseph Presswich to, to pop off to Abbeville while he was on his Easter jolly. Um, and I think that what we do, the, the language is different, the information is different, but I think what we're trying to do now is not a million miles away from what they were trying to do from the 1850s. I've also got a problem with the use of jargon. Um, and I also think that they, as I said, they fail to talk to everybody. And this is, I think they fail to talk to the public, they fail to talk to um, developers, they fail to talk to, to many people. I'm sorry, I've had a hand in writing both of them and I think it's time now to stop. Um, okay, so what do I think we need in its place? I think we need something which builds capacity. Um, I think it needs something that we can share with everybody. Archaeologists, the public, developers, uh, curators, all the people on Frank's list. Um, and I think we need to do much better to explain our interests, our wants, if you like, not needs. It's like Christmas. Christmas is for wants, not for needs. And that should be our framework, should be for wants, they should be aspirational, but we might not um, get everything that we want. There will be no Xbox 360 here. Um, and as I said, I think we should include young researchers who um, will have to work with, with the things that we champion. So we came up with a model which 
Um, it's based on three principles. The, the EQ framework, as, as Clive pointed out, archaeologists love threes. Um, the first one is expansion. And of course, this is, this is what we're talking about with most development control. Can we find new sites? We need new sites desperately. And this is what, um, why I, at the beginning, showed you this rate of change or the rate of discovery. We need new sites. I mean, David... Uh, finds more sites probably in his back garden than we've discovered in 20 years, that that's got to change. Um, there is, I think, an urgent need for new surveys um, and for um, using models of the type that Frank was talking about for predicting deposits, not me, <laughs> uh, predicting deposits, predicting where these deposits might actually fall in their sort of like paleogeography <laughs> and for moving forward with those. Um, but the second one, and I think that the more, actually, I think as, as equally important as um, finding new sites is making the best at what we've got. And the thing is, we're really, really good at this. I, Rob's work um, at Broome, Frank's work at Baker's Hole, has taken sites which we could have lost, and by use of um, targeted field work, but more importantly, an understanding of the archive. And that this is what I want to emphasise more than anything else, is the archive. There is archive out there in museums that we just do not know about. They keep coming up. I was a chat with Peter Hoare at Coffee, and he's discovered a raft of unknown letters from Worthington Smith to various people around um, the, the sort of Dunstable area. And this is all new stuff, which has got the possibility of shedding new light on <coughs> sites that we know of, but we may not know, know enough about. And so one of the things I think that we, we need, I, I don't know how we're going to get this funded, I don't know how we're going to get any of this funded, don't ask me about that, please, is we need an archival database. We need to be able to link objects and the materials um, that actually tell us what those objects mean. Um, and so, as I said, we, we, we've got to, to move on, I think, in this, because... If, if we can bring these th two things together, ideally online so that people have got access to them, I think we can actually start to motor on rather than just plod. Okay, and the final one uh, of my things is engagement. And I think this is really important, and it's not just engagement, it's engagement with everybody that expresses an interest in what we do. And, and I think it needs to be a partnership that's based on a mutual understanding. We need to develop a language that we can all understand. Um, I think, and we've, this was brought up a kind of before the, the, um, before the break, is that we need a national network. We need something along the, along the, the, the route of, of NIAN, the National Ice Age Network, because I think that's the philosophy of that um, was spot on. Um, there were just things that happened uh, during the lifetime of NIAN, uh, which subsequently led to its its demise, and, and I think that what we really need to do is we need to reboot this as something more user-friendly, and, and uh, the British Ice Age Network gives you the, the usual acronym of Brian, although, of course, we might get into trouble with copyright issues with uh, Confused.com on that one. Um, and, of course, the elephant in the room, and this is really, I think, possibly the most important thing I've got to say, is the government's impact agenda and what it means for the academics in this room. Because we... Uh, have to make our work count. It, it can be policy, it can be economic, it can be social, but the work has got to count. Now, okay, why is that important? Well, as I understand it, if my institution is anything to go by, universities are terrified of impact, particularly archaeology departments, and universities are putting money into seed corn funding and into developing impact-related projects. Now, if the government turn around and say that impact is going to be reduced in importance, this money will disappear. So we need to be very quick about developing seed corn ideas. And I think these ideas should be cross-institutional. And the reason I think they should be cross-institutional is if I'm beavering away in Durham and Rob's beavering away in Reading and um, Dan's beavering away in Royal Holloway, then we could end up with, at best, a series of diluted case studies and diluted impact agendas, which are there cynically just to conform to the government and the government's desires for academics, rather than something that could actually make a difference for our discipline. So I think what we should do 
is we should subvert impact and make it work for us. Make it part of what we do in terms of everything we've been talking about today. Um, okay, uh, New Horizons, um, paraphrasing Clive as I like to, uh, thinking big is too small. Um, we need to look to the continent. If we've heard a lot about this um, today. Um, when we do look to the continent, we find this forest of literature. And David, I'm sorry, your English is excellent. My French is apocalyptically bad. So this, this needs to be sorted out in terms of that. And one of the things I think we could do, one of the things we struggle with in this country and, and when we look to the continent is that there's nothing the equivalent of Terps, another English heritage, Historic England um, initiative, which I think has given us in this country an unparalleled database. And it's now online, it's available for study. It has generated, I think, a, a vast number of papers. I use it, Rob uses it, Nick uses it, Becky uses it. We all use this. Um, and so one, one of the things I think we should explore is try to, with European colleagues, develop an idea for a, a, a Terps for Europe, which I think tropes the, the rivers of Paleolithic Europe kind of fits that. This is an idea that Danielle, Dave Bridgend and myself have been discussing. The problem is, is this is a logistical nightmare. It would be a little bit like trying to find one person in this country to work with on developing a thing. Well, you, you need a buy-in from, from many, many people. So I think that one of the other things we need to do, I'm sorry Hannah, I, one, one more sentence. One of the things we do is we need to talk to our, our, our continental colleagues about whether they're interested in this and how we can do it. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Um, again, save your questions for the end. And um, if I can introduce my colleague, Jonathan Lars from Historic England, who's going to talk about Heritage 2020, Effective Frameworks for the Paleolithic. Good afternoon, everyone, and I'll get my apologies in first. Um, I'm not a Paleolithic specialist, so I'm not going to give you a framework for the Paleolithic. Um, I'll try and say something effective, but we'll see <laughs> how that goes. Um, and also, I'm speaking towards the end of the day, so most of these points have been covered already. Um, but again, hopefully, um, we can. Uh, build towards a, a bit more of a discussion of, of some of these points. So I was presented with this title, um, but I think it proved useful in thinking about three senses of frameworks. And I wanted to just pick up and perhaps extend the comments on a few of the things that Mark and colleagues said in the, the document that um, he was just talking to. So firstly, frameworks in the archaeological sense. Um, we have a plethora of these documents. They set out what we know, a resource assessment, what we want to know, a research agenda, and how perhaps we're going to go about finding it out, a research strategy. Um, research frameworks have been championed by Historic England and English Heritage, its predecessor, over the last 20 years. And they aim to provide a common agenda for um, different parts of the sector to work to, um, to provide a research focus for developer-funded work and a means of, uh, of deciding on priorities. Um, on the other hand, they can tread a fine line between um, the generic and the specific. Um, and they can be seen as part of what Marilyn Strathern has termed the audit culture, that they're perhaps they're more about organizing and controlling research than, than facilitating it. Um, and Mark's critique, you've just heard. So there are different views on the values of these documents, and that would be a whole talk in itself. Um, but the, uh, the quote at the top um, is from uh, Mark's document, and as he said, um, suggests that at this academic level, our high-level research questions haven't really changed for 150 years. 
Um, I don't know about the 19th century, but the, the 1948 CBA document, which is the first kind of formal research framework for British prehistory, has these questions for the, uh, the Paleolithic age, as it's called. I'm not going to read them out, so you can have a look and decide whether these are still the same questions we're trying to answer in a different guise or not. <laughs> um, but the key assertion that, uh, um, that the Lost Landscapes team have made is that research frameworks have kind of taken precedence over survey disco and discovery, and they're arguing for a shift of focus from academic research questions to, as we've heard, finding more sites and developing better understanding of old materials. Um, my response to that is that I don't think it's an either-or question, um, and I don't think we can oppose discovery to, to research. I think it's all part of one process. You could argue that a lot of the, the kind of landscape modelling type work that took place under the, the aggregates levy was designed to facilitate the, the discovery of sites by refining understanding of the areas most likely to, to produce them. Um, but I think the key thing is that the frameworks need to be owned by everyone um, and not imposed on it, whether it's by organisations like Historic England or by academics. Um, so really it's up to us as a, as a group to, to decide what we need, um, whether we need the, the research framework and the E3. Um, but I think the key thing is actually to think about how it might work and how to embrace technology, um, perhaps develop a more interactive framework uh, with, a, with a digital platform that is more responsive and scalable. Um, so there's scope there perhaps for better linking discoveries at the site level to some of these, these bigger questions. Um, so rather than saying no more research frameworks, I'll say what sort of research frameworks um, do we need? And how do we integrate this work at different scales? Um, the second kind of framework is the legislative and policy context. And again, these are quotes from the, the Lost Landscapes kind of extra document. Um, and we've heard a bit about this from Francis earlier. But this has two aspects, really, heritage protection, legislation, and planning policy. Um, and the main issue with the former is the problem of sites without structures, as they've been termed, which is basically all open-air Paleolithic sites, failing the definition of what can be legally scheduled. Heritage bills in Scotland and Wales have both amended their definitions, but England still lags behind. Although the work we did for the aborted heritage bill at Westminster a few years ago was uh, made available in the form of the bottom right there, the scheduling, which is basically a scheduling selection guide for sites you can't schedule. So I don't know, I'm not sure whether anyone else in Historic England or DCMS has picked up on the irony, but it's available for you to read in any case. <laughs> um, of course, there are other, other mechanisms for protecting sites with a Paleolithic interest, including the, the Geological Conservation Review and the SSSI system that Natural England administer. And working with them obviously has the advantage of developing relationships between archaeologists and the geoconservation side. And when we do this, there's a lot of approaches in common, also occasional um, differences of practice, which lead to kind of constructive um, discussion, I think, about uh, um, ac maintaining accessibility of, uh, of sites and that kind of thing. Um, other people might argue that we don't want sites scheduled because that would might just close down any any field work. I think this again is a is slightly um, misguided. Um, I think instead what what scheduling does provide is a, a sense of importance for a site like Star Car. I think the scheduling actually enabled um, research field work and funding to uh, to flow um, to that site, and there's also access to um, to funds such as the, the Heritage at Risk funding for fieldwork at Baker's Hole, which is a, an anomalous old Paleolithic scheduling, um, which we probably shouldn't mention too loudly, but the fact that it existed allowed money to be um, uh, targeted at understanding the condition of, of the site. 
Um, so continuing to press for these, this kind of the ability to have uh, assign this legal status to key Paleolithic sites is perhaps something we want to, to maintain. Um, the second aspect of this policy framework is the planning uh, development led investigations um, side. I think there are a number of things that we can and must continue to do in this respect. Um, a lot of these we've heard about um, during the course of the day, improving the representation of the period in HERs, not only ensuring that the data is accurate, but also structured in a way that suits the nature of Paleolithic archaeology. So the deposit model, um, the character area approach, perhaps. Um, we need guidance and training to support curators and units um, who are investigating Paleolithic potential. Um, the middle document on the slide was prepared by John Weimer at the end of the TERPS project in, back in 1998. I think it, it badly needs updating to reflect um, the methodological, te technological and policy developments of the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Um, and we need to improve the, um, the implementation and communication of, of planning conditions. Um, archaeologies, Paleolithic archaeologies um, image problem, if you like, with industry, um, some of which we've, we've heard about, and the consistent application of um, planning policy to, um, to Paleolithic sites and Paleolithic interest. And then the, um, the third type of framework is the kind of overarching concept, really, of heritage or the historic environment and where we see the Paleolithic sitting in this. Um, at Historic England, we've moved from the, the NHPP, the National Heritage Protection Plan, um, under which the, the top set of bullet points was the kind of work we were doing. Um, we're now in a kind of intermediate stage, developing the, a new action plan which will address what is a, a more nebulous and not yet finalised sector-wide initiative called Heritage 2020. And the key um, sort of draft headlines for that are um, in the bottom. And, and, and I think it's about seeing how we can take the opportunities that arise um, from that. And even, even at a level beyond that, where does the Paleolithic sit in this bigger conversation about the value of heritage? How do we position ourselves to get a share of the resources that flow from it in relation to culture, science, landscape, these kind of big concepts? And this is an issue with advocacy and outreach at a, at a wide level. We've heard about the kind of attention, I think. We've heard about the citizen science, the range of interested parties, the fact that everyone is, in, you know, is, is really interested in flints when we talk to them about them, um, and that perhaps the tension that with the, the view that still persists in, in some areas that the Paleolithic is difficult um, and that people are, are not interested or they don't get kind of deep time. Um, so I think we need to kind of understand more um, sort of the values of the wider public and the wider and wider society really and I think this, this links to what Mark was saying about impact how we kind of um, in, you know, beyond just the academic definition how we increase the impact of, of what we do amongst the widest possible audiences how these invisible aspects of heritage can be incorporated into perceptions of landscape into local communities sense of place and into educational initiatives linked to the, the national story. I think we need to present the Paleolithic as a kind of seamless part of the, the long durée of human occupation. At present, it, it sometimes seems to be treated separately from the rest of archaeological heritage because it is often found in different locations, done by different people, subject to different protection regimes maybe, and not well represented on key databases. Um, but I think everything that, that we've heard today um, has shown that um, we have these engaging and relevant stories about deep time that includes human origins, where we all come, come from, and the changing relationships between people 
climate and environment. So, you know, the three questions, like what, what kind of research frameworks do we need? What do um, curators, units and others need for a consistent and a proportionate approach to the Paleolithic? And how do we sell the Paleolithic and make it part of the bigger kind of cultural and scientific picture? As I say, we have these um, engaging, relevant stories. And after all, who can think about the mega floods that formed the English Channel um, without wondering what the simple hominins who were around then thought about it all? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so, if uh, Mark, would you like to come up for questions? Um, I think um, just before the break, then, Liz, you got cut off short a little. I don't know whether you wanted to. Where have you gone? Is Liz here? She's gone. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to see if Liz wanted to pick up what she was saying um, just before the break, but um, if anyone else wants to take that up, then feel free. Does anyone have any questions? Can you hold the mic closer so you right can? representation of the period of a more Western continental Britain in the last and into research, joint. And not only the methods that are used in other countries, but also relating the archaeology directly to the British landscape, because it is actually part of that landscape as well. And I'm wondering how that could become part of the research agenda. Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I'm in a position to really to talk about the, uh, the sort of continental picture. I think that probably says something about <laughs> historic England. And, um, uh, but I think the, the initiative that, um, that was developed, I think, with the North Sea prehistory framework um, a few years ago is something that we could, could pick up again. And I think that the sort of maritime work that we've heard about really... Um, uh, provides a uh, you know a means of, of engaging you know a number of, of countries around the the North Sea and basin and the Channel in particular, and I'm sure um, yeah, I can't talk. Mark can maybe talk about common research interests, but I think um, we can begin to talk about um, how we address some of the the sort of um, conservation management and um, knowledge issues that that document um, identified. I put it in my presentation because I think it's, it's rather languished slightly of late and it would be interesting to pick that up again. Yeah, I mean, one point I'd like to make is the fact that I mentioned France as an example. Of course, if you're, if you're looking at continental connections, you have to take the entire seaboard. And um, I would also suggest that if we're... I mean, this idea of this European Rivers Project this grand design to go all the way over to the Urals, you know, and then we panicked a bit, and so I pulled it back in, pulled it back in. So, you know, you then get the lowlands, France, and Spain. I include Spain, I know it's not the nearest neighbor necessarily, but it could be a potential refugia. And I think that these are the types of questions that we can answer with this, uh, starting off in these sort of zonal approach and moving it across. But I agree with you, we have to do it. But the problem is, um, Will, is that the middle's missing. The middle's missing. We've got all the edges of the jigsaw, but we haven't got the middle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, it's underneath the, the sea, and this is where Rachel and her colleagues, you know, this is why I was talking about paleogeography and that. Well, if I can respond to that, um, <laughs> when you look, look at South East England, basically, the examples we had from the northeast of France on the plateau are very different environments than we get in South East England. We don't have these huge extents of universities, of course, at least not that extent, so it'll be very different statutory. But there are other Belgian, Netherlands, so it's very similar asteroid environments that we might want to relate to more directly, especially for those questions. And I'm wondering if that's taken into consideration. Is it the fact that the Lois isn't here or the Lois gone? Where's Simon Lewis? I mean, if talking to um, Robin Dennell a couple of weeks ago, I mean, Robin, who's like, you know, 
if you want to learn about archaeology and learn, talk to Robin. Um, but Robin's of the opinion that, that it was here and it's gone. You know, this is why when we were on Jersey, he's talking about the fact we're talking about the, the, uh, the plateau at La Cotte and whether you could actually physically drive mammoth across it. It's a really broken, rolling landscape. There's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't be able to run mammoth over it. And Robin Dunnell said, we'll turn it into a tabletop full of, full of lurs. You know, so there are these questions about you know, the, the landscapes we've got today um, are compared to what the landscapes were like in the past. Francis. Yes, I know there's lots of interesting things to say about all these presentations. One particular point I wanted to make was the issue about public engagement and appreciation of the Paralympic. Actually, in terms of France, we're, we're, in England we're trying to say that the Paralympic is part of the heritage trend and entire support. But France itself has got the whole separate subject called prehistory with its own mythology. So in some ways, the Paleolithic of France is part of a separate field from the rest of French archaeology. But in Britain, the public are generally really interested in the Ice Age and early man and mammoths and all that. The people who are most down on the Paleolithic are archaeologists. It's, 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 your, it's your grizzled curator or your grizzled um, rolled up smoking field archaeologist who's going about monkey rocks. And with friends like that, <laughs> it's it's, I think that is where the first engagement agenda needs to address. <laughs> okay, I agree with that, Frank. <laughs> so, Jonathan, do you want to? Um, yeah, I think there's a there's a grain of truth in that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it, I think so, to a certain extent, it's because um, people feel they don't understand it for some reason, um, and so I think you know, there is a, a communic there is an onus on us to. Um, uh, to communicate to them and uh, um, sort of make make the case. I, th I think we can also be our own worst enemies. I think we're very good at repeatedly saying why the Paleolithic is special and different and difficult, and perhaps we need to try and do a little bit less of that and focus on the common things that we, we can say. Mark, do you want to pick up on? No, I, mean, I, th I, I agree with the, the whole engagement thing and uh, with Frank's point of it. But the other thing is, is that I would say that if we can get people young as well, we can win their hearts and minds. Um, I, I'm excavating in, in, um, in South Yorkshire in the summer and I've already got four local school groups coming. It's going to take me two whole days to sort of like show them. If we find a single flake, um, that would be a remarkable discovery, believe me. But, you know, they're coming, they're interested. We're just going to talk about, you know, man mammoths and, and stuff like that. Get them early with the interested stuff and it, it will be a, an interest that, will, that generate, goes on. So yeah, I think that the fact that prehistory is now in the national curriculum for history is, is a great opportunity, but, of course, it's in the primary curriculum, so we really need to think hard about uh, yeah. giving teachers the resources that they need, um, because I think they're another group that feels they don't understand, not just the Paleolithic, but prehistory in general. Give them the resources um, that will allow them to actually teach um, the children of, of that age yeah. in an appropriate way. And as you say, try and hook them young. Yeah, we also, we also can actually mould what we, what we do to, to what they're doing as well, because one of the things that these year, their year, their eight to nine year olds, is that year four or year five, I can't remember. Um, for, um, and they're doing biomes and they've already been down to the gorge where I'm working and they've done the biomes of the gorge and so my thing to the teacher I said I'll tell you what we'll do I'll do ice age biomes I'll get them to imagine everything that's different about this and populate with different and you know and we've got a tiny little cave that we can sort of like, have a look in there isn't it dark but yeah we, we can do all of this but as Frank said you know um, we do need to start talking amongst ourselves in a common language as well um, there is a habit as well for little research groups to develop their own languages. Um, there has just been a, a project undertaken at Historic England looking specifically at how heritage science can feed into the science curriculum, which I think we're waiting for a report shortly. Mm -hmm. might be um, we've got three questions waiting. One, at, firstly, at the back, and then. Can I do this again? <coughs> I'm sorry, Frank. I'm not having that. <laughs> 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 I'm just not having that. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, broadening out to your horizons a bit and engaging the rest of the field archaeologists out there who do the rest of the British archaeology. And I think maybe some sort of people like you, Frank, be too easy a lot of good to go out and dig, you know, the old the Kent or the filler or the farmhouse, the the evil cemetery to, you know, there is, there is more out there. And I think perhaps if there wasn't, you know, the, the sort of silos, that, I think there is a silo in the field of archaeology. We've seen it even this morning, you know, this thing about okay, good nature. Do you have a pair of thick lady people in there? You know, the sort of uh, handbags and flake bashes down, down the road. So I think, you know, I think that side has to, has to break down a bit. And the other thing is, I would agree entirely Mark, about the uh, research framework thing. I've had to write bits of that, at least the uh, resource assessment and a resource, a research strategy. And by far and away, the most useful bits of any of that I found when I then later on came to use this stuff was the resource assessment. <laughs> because you actually had somebody who'd been paid to sit down go through all the dots on the map, read the excavation reports, and just sit down and actually tell, write down on a piece of paper, what we know about a particular period at a particular time. Yeah. And that's sort of generating knowledge. Yeah. And that's the, most, and that's the starting point for any research. Yeah. And, um, you know, but the rest of it, you know, the, the agenda and the strategy and, is transient and, and becomes yeah. limited. Yeah, and one of the one of the reasons I was I forgot to say, but one of the reasons I was emphasising survey and going on about we need to sort of resurvey. I wasn't saying that we need to redo terps. Don't get me wrong. What I do think we need to do is we need to redo the 1968 um, CBA gazetteer of Paleolithic yeah. um, finds. If, if if for no other reason, the closure of museums in the intervening 50 years, because there are as I say archive. There's archive that's unknown. The entire Passmore Edwards is some, yeah, in some yeah. hangar in Essex, yeah. apart from the bits that are in my office. But, um, so, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you, uh, John. Can I just make one point, if it must, for the <laughs> 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 A quick one, Frank. I think the real place to get at is the curators who feel they cannot justify very big work. I think that's the, the real issue. It's a chicken and egg there, Frank. I think we had a, a question. <laughs> Might have to leave that there. I'd like to enjoy that discussion over a glass of wine later. Um, yes, sir. Um, uh, Randy Downing, University of Bradford. Um, I agree with Mark that we really do need to focus on impact. But I don't think this is the way to do it. I think what we need to do is actually go back to what makes us scientists in, in prehistory. We need to focus on what are the big research questions. Um, the public is, is excitingly interested in this period, but we're not picking up on that. They want to know what makes us human. How are we different from Neanderthals and other species? Um, when did we get to Britain? How, did we, how were we able to survive here? There are lots and lots of big questions that we should be trying to answer, and the public will come along with us. They, these are the things they want to know as well. Um, and use this as the framework uh, rather than simply <coughs> listening, we want more science, we want a database. Well, with all due respect, uh, Randy, I, I don't think that's what the government understand by impact. It's not about the results of our research, it's about the economic, social, and the other benefits in the much wider world. It's not about just having a programme on Channel 4 saying we've got the oldest site in Britain. What they want is to make sure that we contribute to society. So yeah. they want the people to be happy with what we're doing. That's what impact all of that. Well, we've got a member of the last ref panel yes. there. Hopefully, enlighten us. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, after all, uh, remember that the impact agenda was, um, it emerged uh, after the uh, ref had been announced. So everyone was uh, running around trying to discover what impact was. And it was extremely broad. 
Uh, it's, it's more interesting to actually ask what the impact is going to be in 2020 or 2021, whenever the next ref or whatever it's called uh, actually comes in there. But, uh, you know, it, 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 the government is looking to see that the research that it's been funding through HEFKE actually has an impact on people's lives. And uh, the impacts are, are, are um, described in a whole raft of ways, from policy to economic to uh, social to cultural to whatever. And I thought that in, 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 the, in the last ref, uh, archaeology was extremely good at kind of um, a very short notice of matching what it did uh, to, those, to those impact agendas and had a very strong show. Uh, where it fell down was if it just said, you know, I, I had an excavation and 20 people came to visit it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sort of outreach engagement just didn't, just didn't wash. But, what, but when you had a strategy for impact and you could show how you delivered on it, then it was, uh, archaeology was doing as well as any other subject. Yeah. So I think we're coming up for half past. We've got two more questions, Rob and then Becky. Are you okay? All right. All yours, Becky. <laughs> Yeah, it was just a, an aside, really, rather than a question, but oh, we get all worked up about impact and what we're expected to do and blah, blah, the government has expected us to do this yet, but we have a responsibility to share and communicate what we're doing anyway, because this isn't our stuff, we don't own it, this is everybody's Paleolithic heritage, and, you know, we, we have a responsibility to communicate that anyway. We shouldn't be worrying about hitting the right button, getting the right sort of funding. We should be doing this for its own sake anyway, because you know we're, we're doing this for everybody. This isn't, I'm not doing this for my own sake, you know. Well, I, I, th I think you're absolutely right, Becky, but I think that the opportunity to sort this out is, is now. I mean, as, as Clive has explained last time, we were running around trying to retrofit a lot of our practices to a strategy which we didn't have before they told us that we had to have one. Um, now we know that this is in place, we don't know how important it's going to be, but we can have a strategy. And my point is, is exactly your point, is rather than what happens in some institutions, perhaps a little bit in my own as well, is that you're sort of going to people, have you got an impact case study? And they say, oh, well, I don't know, but maybe I could deal with it. We need actually to build these things into our research designs and what we do from the start. Which should we do anyway? Yeah. But the thing is, is the thing is, my point is, Becky, is it's, it's, it's not outreach anymore. You know, it's not just about community digs and stuff like that. It's, it's a much, it's a more nebulous thing, I think, but um, something that we, we can we could actually adopt as a, as a working practice, that our work must be important to more than just the people that we speak to on a daily basis. I think there's a whole diversity of audiences that yeah. we, we need to think about how we address from eight-year-olds to uh, quarry managers to county archaeologists to television audiences. And um, I think we need to spend more time um, thinking about that aspect. We need Brian Cox. <laughs> Who's the Brian Cox for the Paleolithic? <laughs> 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 so apparently that clock is five minutes fast, so we have time for one more question, if anyone's got that. Matt. I mean, oh, sorry. <coughs> what you were saying about making sure we make this count, I mean, as, as Becky says, we have all have a responsibility as public archaeologists. We all spend a huge amount of our time, not paid time, time at the weekends, in the evenings, working in all kinds of ways outside of academia with all sorts of different audiences. But the trouble is, none of this actually counts in a ref impact framework because none of it's accounted for, none of it's documented, time sheeted, none of it actually fits into strategies. Again, I think this is where talking about kind of a, a more networked approach to what we do means that everything could be accounted for. Mm. That would mean, as you intimated, devolving an impact strategy across lots of different departments. Yeah. It can no longer be the pet, pet impact case study that's going to get that department to stand out above all the others. Yeah. And you know, it's how we make that work. And I just wonder how, how you would see we would balance that. <coughs> well, I, I, I think we, we, we probably need some steer from um, the REF when the when the um, when the, the rules are eventually published, um, 
we'll, we'll probably about know where, where we are on that. And, and, but I, I do think that, that from our point of view, from Palliative point of view, and it might not be 2020, 2021, it might be the following one. Um, but I could just imagine a time where the REF panel has, uh, have got eight different impact case studies all claiming to have done this wonderful stuff with the Palliative Heritage Agenda. And it just be seen straight through. We, I think we need to be more coordinated. I mean, we do generally get on. I mean, at least we've got one thing for it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, we have our spats, don't we, Frank? But, you know, we forget about them and move on. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, there's impact with the little i, which goes much wider than the yeah, ref and yeah. the academic uh, definition. And we, we all, you know, we can all work together, I think. Um, I think that's where other public bodies come in to help provide that impact because it's through working with people like ourselves at Historic England with curators with local groups that you can bring that together it's back mm. to that network again mm. has anyone got any final questions or comments no stunned silence so um, oh Rob I mean only to know that only to know that the value of the sort of networking that a number of colleagues have talked about should help us do one of those really tricky things uh, with the more formal impact agenda, which is, it's not just that you've done the outreach, it's can you document change behaviour? Mm. Now, documenting the fact you've genuinely impacted on yeah. your audience, you've changed some aspect of what they do, how they behave, becomes much easier when you're all tied into a network where you can follow that through, and it's not six months here or a few weeks there, it's several years, yeah. and it allows you to, to track the, the effects that you're having over the longer term. I, th I, think, I think for, for me, and I, and I know for other people I spoke to about this, is actually of the, the awful word evidencing impact is the, is the thing, that the, is the difficult thing. Yeah. I, I, you know, and you know, we, I, I come from an institution where a, a, an ex-colleague was never off the television. But you know, four thousand or four million people watching a Channel Four thing on the domestication of dogs really—how do you demonstrate any impact on that? They could have been doing the ironing when they were watching it. It's, you know, there's, there's, it needs to be something tangible, something that we can show. So I guess you don't start a, a project until you know how you're going to measure the impact. Well, no, I think it should be built <laughs> from the beginning. Yeah, exactly. You, exactly. you, just, you, something. you just build it. In. It's, mm. it's something that we need to think about now. Um, you know, we're faced as, as academics, I'm sure, as, as everybody in the room is, is faced with increasing um, and increasingly ridiculous initiatives from the government. Um, and we've just got to find a way. And I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm fed up of fighting. I prefer to subvert. So, just, <laughs> and if this is subversion by adoption, then so be it. <laughs> subversion by doing what they want you to do. <laughs> <laughs> Begrudgingly. <laughs>